Hey, Mike here. I just wanted to let you know that you can listen to Dark Poutine early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. All right, and we are back for yet another episode of Dark Poutine. I am Michael Brown, and that is Matthew Stockton. And this one has me riled up, Mike. Oh my gosh. In our pre-show planning, Matthew is just... Livid. He's livid. Yeah. And I am too. And it's why I wrote it the way I wrote it, because I knew it would be provocative and it would get people talking. This is one that is really probably going to make you think, folks. Mm. And uh, hopefully make you think more about human beings. Yes. The views, information, and opinions expressed during the Dark Poutine podcast are solely those of the producer and do not necessarily represent those of Curious Cast, its affiliate Global News, nor its parent company, Chorus Entertainment. Dark Poutine is not for the faint of heart or squeamish. Our content is often intense and some listeners may find it disturbing. We are not experts on the topics we present, nor are we journalists. We are ordinary Canadian schmucks chatting about crime and the dark side of history. Let's get to it. Put on your toque, grab yourself a double-double and an Nanaimo bar. It's time to scarf down some dark poutine. You are responsible for obtaining and maintaining at your own cost all equipment needed to listen to dark poutine. Dark poutine can be addictive. Side effects may include, but not be limited to, pausing and questioning the system, elevated heart rate, pondering humanity, odd looks from colleagues as you laugh out loud at work, family members not into true crime worrying about you. Positive side effects may include some perspectives and opinions that you disagree with, as well as some wokeness and empathy. If you don't think dark poutine is for you, consult your doctor immediately. In Quebec City on October 21, 2004, Dario Galesi got an alarming phone call from his younger brother Eustachio. In the call, Eustachio admitted to killing his girlfriend Chantal Deschamps, 32. Following his brother's advice, Eustachio contacted the police to report the crime. Eustachio was arrested, charged and convicted of the second-degree murder of Chantal Deschamps. In late 2006, Eustachio was sentenced to life in prison without parole eligibility for 15 years. In 2019, Eustachio was placed into a halfway house on day parole. In September, the Parole Board of Canada learned that Eustachio Galesi's case management team had allowed him to visit sex workers to have his sexual needs met as long as he was transparent with them about these visits. It was determined at this time that the practice should cease. However, a terrible chain of events was already in motion. On the night of January 22, 2020, Eustachio Galesi walked into a Quebec City police station and admitted to having murdered another woman, a 22-year-old masseuse named Marilyn Levesque, whom he'd become obsessed with. Marilyn's body was found in the saint Foix hotel room where Galesi said she would be. She'd been stabbed 30 times. A month later, Eustachio Galesi, then 51, pleaded guilty to first-degree murder and was sentenced to life in prison with no chance of parole for 25 years. After a public outcry inciting parliamentary debate, the Correctional Service of Canada and the Parole Board of Canada announced a joint investigation into Mary Lenn's murder. This is Dark Poutine, Episode 279, Repeat Offender. The murders of Chantal Deschamps and Marilyn Levesque. Eustachio Galesi grew up in a large, close-knit family with strong bonds between the five siblings and their parents. He was in a long-term common-law relationship with Joanne LaFrance from 1996 to 2003, and they had three children together. 
At the time of Eustachio's first murder, their first child was six years old, and they also had four-year-old twins. The relationship between Eustachio and Joanne had been tumultuous, marked by instances of property damage caused by Eustachio in fits of anger, including a violent physical assault on Joanne during a trip to Ottawa. These incidents were often linked to his heavy consumption of alcohol and drugs. He'd often claim he either couldn't remember being violent or said the alcohol had impaired his ability to make moral decisions. Galesi was convicted of conjugal violence against Joanne in 1997 in Ontario and sentenced to seven days in jail. However, Joanne claimed not to fear Eustachio and described him as a good father to their three children, albeit often absent due to his demanding job. She noted that his issues with alcohol and cocaine became severe following the birth of their twins, which prompted her to urge him to seek treatment. Despite attempting to quit multiple times, the longest Eustachio managed to stay sober was slightly over a hundred days. Following the separation with Joanne, in December 2003, Eustachio, a 36-year-old restaurant manager, moved on. He'd met Chantal Deschamps, a 32-year-old bartender, while working at the Hotel Quebec earlier that year. They began seeing each other. Their relationship became official at Christmas, and they moved into Chantal's apartment together in saint foy The first few months went well. Galassi, nicknamed Stash, took his children and Chantal's kids to skate or play on Sundays. The couple's relationship deteriorated quickly over the next few months. Galassi was drinking and using drugs a lot and appeared to be depressed. He consulted a doctor and psychologist and was given medical leave from work. In September 2004, Eustachio's siblings began noticing signs of exhaustion and depression in him. He was prescribed medication for his symptoms but chose not to take it. His siblings suspected he was grappling with a spiraling addiction to alcohol and cocaine. Despite their persistent attempts, Eustachio's siblings unsuccessfully persuaded him to go to seek help. Eustachio maintained that his demanding job, which required more than 60 hours of work a week, left him with little spare time. He planned to quit his job by the end of 2004 due to the intense work pressure. So you've jumped right into a lot of horrible stuff pretty quickly here. Right. Right? This guy is on a downward spiral fast. So the reason I did that is because this first murder, his background prior to that, there's not a lot of information about who they were, who he was. Right. Because sadly, and I'm saying sadly, Honestly, domestic murder is not treated with much attention here right, in Canada. Right. Perhaps because it isn't sensational enough. It's not spectacle enough. Yeah, it's them. not spectacle enough. Okay. I mean, there was some coverage, but there wasn't nearly as much as obviously what happened after Eustachio's second murder. But we'll get there. Right. Galesi later claimed that Chantal Deschamps often returned home late around 6 a.m., which was well beyond the end of her shift at the Hotel Quebec bar. Galesi expressed discontent with her late-night returns and criticized her for having improper conversations with her colleagues. Deshaun confided in her mother, grandmother, and co-worker about her partner's controlling nature, citing his jealousy and constant monitoring. Witnesses gave conflicting accounts, with some describing Eustachio as overly jealous, while others claimed that both were possessive, often leading to disputes. Eustachio claimed he was considering leaving Chantal to return to Joanne and their children. Days before her tragic end, Chantal Deschamps expressed to her friend Giselle Brisson that she was afraid of leaving Galassi due to the potential threat to her job. There were no indications of physical abuse at that time, but she did express fear of Eustachio to her grandmother revealing her intent to leave him. However, he refused to let her go. Her grandmother suggested that she contact police, a suggestion Deshaun refused out of fear. Her grandmother also later recounted disturbing threats made by Galesi where he had vowed to disfigure Deshaun to prevent anyone else from seeing her beauty. Chantel's mother testified that Galesi had issued a chilling warning to her daughter, stating, quote, If you want to leave me, no one will ever get you. End quote. On October 20, 2004, the day before her death, taxi driver Louis Plant noticed that Deshaun seemed nervous. She confided in him that she had just ended her relationship with Galesi and they'd had an argument. Despite their breakup, they spent the night of October 20th together in their home. 
On October 21, 2004, an argument broke out between Eustachio and Chantel after she returned from work in the early hours. The babysitter, who had stayed overnight to care for Chantel's daughters, overheard the dispute. The morning after, Eustachio Galesi brutally murdered Chantal Deschan, claiming she had initially tried to attack him with a hammer. He then reportedly grabbed the weapon and hit her multiple times before stabbing her in the face and chest with two butcher knives. The pathologist concluded that the victim was strangled and never left the bed during or after the attack. Following the brutal murder, Galesi covered Deschan's body with a comforter and wrote cryptic messages on the wall. One day, plot. Always plot. I'm not sure what that means. Panicked, he considered suicide, wrote farewell notes to his children and their mother, and professed his love for the children's babysitter. He covered the bedroom window with fabric to prevent the children from witnessing the gruesome scene. Later that day, Eustachio picked up Chantel's daughters from school and took them out for lunch. Before doing so, he left a case containing a large sum of money at Joanne's house. After lunch, he confessed to his brother over the phone about murdering Chantel. Dario persuaded Eustachio to turn himself in, and he surrendered to the police, insisting they reach the school before the children returned home to discover their mother's lifeless body. Okay, he is a horrible murderer. Yeah. But I'm glad he at least did that. Yeah, but you know what? There's also this weird stuff about dropping money off at his ex's place. I guess setting his ex and maybe his kids it's up. It's all strange. Yeah. And, and then taking the kids out for lunch after he's murdered their mom. Yeah, it's, it's strange. I have to say, though, mm -hmm. good on his brother for doing the right thing. Yeah. You know, because we've, we've seen a lot of times, Mike, where family members help people hide and do, and his, sure. his, his brother sounds like he has a bit of a head on his shoulders and persuaded his brother to turn himself in, which is, is good. Yeah. No matter what a brother does, it would be always hard to do that. Right. Right. Yeah. Upon their arrival at the residence, the police discovered Chantal's body alongside several blood-stained knives and a broken hammer. The gruesome scene testified to the brutality of the murder. The autopsy report revealed that Chantal had been asphyxiated and received blunt force head and face trauma inflicted with the hammer and Eustachio's fists. She was stabbed 15 times. While in custody, Eustachio claimed that Chantal had attacked him with the hammer, which led to an alcohol-fueled memory blackout during which he couldn't recall his actions. Medical personnel treated his swollen right hand but found no other significant injuries on his body. Upon inspecting the scene, investigators found blood droplets in the residence's kitchen, bathroom, and bedroom. On the bedroom wall, there was a chilling handwritten message, written in felt pen and contained insults directed at Chantal and the names of Eustachio's children and his heartfelt declaration of love toward the children's babysitter. Eustachio's defense was that Chantel had provoked him, of course. Mm -hmm. The provocation defense was based on a visible bump on his right hand claimed to be a fracture from a hammer attack by the victim. The evidence suggested otherwise. The orthopedic expert for the prosecution explained that the boxer's fracture on Eustachio's hand typically results from a closed fist punch against a hard surface. He also noted the lack of any abrasions, wounds, or cuts on the hand. That would indicate a hammer blow by Eustachio's fist, not a blow to his fist by a hammer in Chantel's hand, as he claimed. Mm -hmm. A crime scene technician described the victim's blood being present only on her upper body, arms, neck, and head, not on the lower body, suggesting that she was covered with a sheet at the time of the attack. This was inconsistent with Eustachio's account of the events. So was she lying in bed when he attacked her? That's what it looks like. And did he use the fact that he hurt his hand hitting her as... As his defense. Try to be evidence that she hurt me. Yep. Horrible. According to the news organization Le Soleil, the jury trial of Galesi's second-degree murder of Chantal Deschamps lasted less than two weeks in the late autumn of 2006. All stenographic notes fit into a single box. On December 16, 2006, Eustachio Galesi was found guilty of the unpremeditated murder of his spouse, Chantal Deschamps. The jury, composed of ten men and two women, delivered the verdict. 
Before the judge announced the minimum sentence of 15 years in prison, 38-year-old Galessi apologized to Chantal's family, making it clear he was not seeking forgiveness. Following her daughter's murder, Louise Deschamps took custody of Chantal's 8- and 12-year-old children. Ms. Deschamps expressed that the verdict could potentially provide some comfort during the holiday season. What an awful Christmas gift. Upon entering federal custody, offenders undergo a comprehensive intake assessment to identify their correctional needs. This process involves collecting various types of information about the offender and the crime from sources including police, courts, victims, family members, and the offender themselves. This information is used to create a criminal profile of the offender and a correctional plan. The plan outlines necessary interventions and recommended correctional programs linked to factors contributing to criminal behavior, aiming to minimize the offender's risk of reoffending upon conditional release in the future. And the correctional plan is a reference for tracking the offender's progress throughout their sentence and can be adjusted as necessary. As part of this intake assessment, and periodically thereafter, the Correctional Service of Canada, CSC, determines the appropriate security level based on three criteria, institutional adjustment, escape risk, and risk to public safety. In 2007, believing that Galesi represented a high risk of violence against a partner, the Parole Board of Canada refused his request for release. In 2009, Eustachio appealed, asking for a reduction in his sentence. He claimed the jury did not give him the benefit of the doubt regarding his provocation defense. His appeal was denied, and his sentence remained in place. In 2016, because of his good behavior in prison, Galesi gradually began working toward his freedom through supervised outings. He was released to a halfway house on day parole in March 2019 and got a job. In September of that year, he sought further freedom, including full parole. The Corrections Conditional Release Act, CCRA, outlines that the parole board considers two things when granting parole. One, that the offender will not, by reoffending, present an undue risk to society before the end of their sentence, and the offender's release will contribute to society's protection by facilitating the offender's reintegration into the community as a law-abiding citizen. During a September 19, 2019 hearing, a transitional housing facility clinical worker presented Eustachio Galesi's case to the parole board. The worker outlined Galesi's progress since his release, risk factors, ongoing issues, and collaboration with the case management team. The plan proposed by the worker was to continue Galesi's day parole while full parole was not recommended then. The clinical worker also explained that the case management team had allowed Galesi to visit a massage parlor to satisfy his intimate needs due to his openness about his sexual requirements. This arrangement was seen as a more effective and safer risk management strategy than Galesi using dating sites. More about that later, but yeah. <laughs> I am sorry. This is where I started getting livid earlier. Yep. I'd have told him to make really good friends with his right hand if he had sexual needs. Right. He's already shown that he cannot be trusted in relationships with a woman. But, oh, ugh. Yeah. Jerk off. Yeah. Like, like. At the time, the parole board decided that this practice of paying for sex should stop and told Eustachio this verbally. However, it is mentioned very briefly in the report. Journal de Quebec released excerpts of the report by the Parole Board of Canada. They follow, quote, Your parole officer pointed out that a strategy has been developed by your case management team so that you can meet women, but only to meet your sexual needs by attending a massage parlor, a way that was later deemed inappropriate by the commission. The risk management strategy, as understood and presented to the hearing, paradoxically constituted a significant and worrying risk factor. So he's a danger still. Although you are still single, and you say you're not ready to enter into a serious relationship with a woman, you can assess your needs effectively. At the time of your acting out in 2004, you were struggling with a problem of impulsivity, aggressiveness, and a low tolerance for frustration and at least one spouse had been a victim of this in 1997, his first wife, end quote. So my summary of all of this is, is the parole board thinks that he's too dangerous for women. Yeah. 
who aren't sex workers. Right. But with sex workers, in their minds, mm. and remember, this isn't some sort of... It's not the parole board who said, because remember, they said, okay. this, is, this should stop. It's his case management okay. team. Then the case management team. Okay. okay. Wait. The system, right? right? His case management team thought too dangerous for women who aren't sex workers, but with sex workers, it's a worthwhile risk. That is what they decided. That is what they decided. Disgusting. Yeah. Truly disgusting. Dehumanizing. Disgusting. Those people should be ashamed of themselves. They should be. Eustachio was required to report any relationships with women, sexual or otherwise, and was forbidden to consume drugs or alcohol. Not telling his case management team he was doing so, Eustachio continued going to Gentleman Paradise Massage Parlor for erotic massage. He had quickly become obsessed with a 21-year-old masseuse named Marilyn Levesque. She was beautiful, compassionate, and kind. Eustachio wanted to spend as much time with Marilyn as he could, but wanted more than just massage. He'd bought her expensive gifts, including a television, for Christmas. Eustachio would sometimes show up at the parlor under the influence, and he was eventually barred from the salon after being violent with other workers there. Eustachio thought he'd fallen in love with Mary Lynn. She had rejected his wishes to elevate the relationship and wanted to keep it strictly professional. This was a severe blow to Eustachio Galesi's fragile ego. He began thinking dark thoughts about Mary Lynn. Eustachio bought a knife at some point in the week's leading up to her death. More after a quick break. Matthew Ox. <laughs> Mike, I don't... This is all I can keep saying is that this is outrageous. Yeah. It's completely outrageous. Mm-hmm. Right? I, are you going to share photos of this woman? I probably should on the on, website. On the website, maybe I'll do it in the on our uh, Facebook page. You see a lovely, beautiful human being. Yeah, yep, yeah. She was. She looked like the girl next door kind of thing. Yeah. Eustachio Galesi met with Mary Lynn Levesque at a hotel restaurant in Saint Foy, Quebec, at 5:47 p.m. on January 20th, 2020. He was carrying a concealed knife he'd purchased a few days prior. At around 7.23 p.m., he led Mary Lynn into a hotel room, and there he stabbed her 30 times. He left the crime scene at the hotel around 8.45 p.m., and later, at about 11.34 p.m., Galesi turned himself in at a police station in the borough of Cité Limoilou, Quebec City, confessing that he had committed murder. At 12.08, paramedics officially pronounced Mary Lynn deceased. By 1.15 a.m., Quebec City Police Service had contacted Galesi's halfway house to notify them of Galesi's arrest for the murder. Mary Lynn Levesque was from Chicoutimi and lived in Saguenay with her boyfriend. She came to Quebec City for two days every two weeks to work at the massage parlor on Branley Avenue. She stayed in Quebec with her platonic male friend. Mary Lynn's friend said it was unclear whether Mary Lynn knew that Galesi had murdered Chantal. According to Le Soleil News, the friend said, quote, She told me, yeah, he's a little creepy. He made prison because of the story with his wife. Of course, it scares me a little, but it's in a hotel in the middle of the city, said the friend. She thought she was safe. Despite Galesi's criminal past, Levesque accepted his offer of $2,000 for a meeting at the hotel. While she expressed feelings of fear and discomfort about Galesi, the allure of the payment seemed to overcome her apprehension. This was not Levesque's first meeting with Galesi under these conditions. Just two weeks prior, she'd met him in a similar setting for a payment of $1,300. The friend who was privy to Levesque's feelings about Galesi expressed his deep concern for her safety and strongly advised her against the meeting. We don't want to imply that Mary Lynn had in any way contributed to her murder. She was acting on the information she had at the time, and Galesi had led her to believe she had nothing to worry about. However, recognizing her strong-willed nature and the enticing financial gain that Galesi offered, her friend felt his warnings went unheeded. He must have felt so awful after this went down. 
Yeah. Um, imagine the feeling of guilt, the mm -hmm. feeling of I, I should have stopped her. Yeah. But adults have make their own decisions, right? And he couldn't, like, he couldn't forcibly hold her down to stop her from going because, you know, it was a maybe, right? Mm -hmm. It wasn't even a maybe. It was just like, yeah, it's not the best thing to do. Right. Right. But, and then you'd be, you'd be going through that conversation in your head a million times after that. Yeah, you definitely would. The poor guy. A former masseuse who'd worked for nearly a year and a half with Mary Lynn Levesque was troubled by her death. She told Le Soleil, quote, she had the future ahead of her. She was generous and there for her friends. To her knowledge, masseuses very rarely saw customers outside the salon. Quote, we all know that it's dangerous to do that. Generally, women who work in salons do so precisely for our protection. Several customers who'd been staying at the Hotel Sepia were surprised to hear the news. They'd not heard anything. Denis Plant of Valleyfield said, quote, I was two rooms away from the event. I returned to my room after dinner around 6.30 p.m. Apparently everything had already happened, end quote. Mary Lynn's boyfriend, Gabriel Truchon, was heartbroken. He knew Mary Lynn had worked in the sex industry, but desperately wanted her to quit. Quote, she didn't want to do that anymore. She was done with it. I told her to stop, that she was hurting herself. Mary wanted a more stable life to have children and perhaps get into the world of architecture, explained Gabriel. You know, Gabriel talking uh, about her like that mm -hmm. helps, I hope helps people understand that sex workers aren't this unidimensional, they're just this one thing. Right. That, and I, just, I can't believe I said it, they're human beings. Right. With complexities and dreams and hopes and family. You've written here, they aren't unnamed sex worker handcuffed to a cop's desk in the 1970s. Yeah. Yeah, that, that, that's an image that we grew up with. This to sort see. of caricature. Yeah. Of what a sex worker is, right? Mm -hmm. And sex workers aren't all necessarily drug addicts. No. Uh, Mike, I've known mm -hmm. in London, right. I've known sex workers, boys and girls, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And, you know, they have, they have boyfriends, they have girlfriends, they're n normal people. They just... They, they have lives. They do this job and, you know, n n none of them want to be in it forever. Right. Right. But it's paying the bill while they go to university and stuff like that. Yep. So maybe that's why I get so upset because I've known some and they're just actually surprisingly, boringly, just normal human beings, right? Yeah. <laughs> Mary Lynn's boyfriend Gabriel continued, quote, I know that people judge me, but I don't care. She was going to work in Quebec City. She had her role there. It wasn't me who forced her to do that. On the contrary, but you know, she made a lot of money. It's hard to leave that environment. When she was in Saguenay with me, we had our little life with our dog. On social media, Gabriel wrote, I have no words to describe all the pain I feel. Everything can change in a second. I love you with all my heart. Watch over us all from above. I miss you already, end quote. On the night of Mary Lynn's murder, a friend had messaged Gabriel claiming he'd received a FaceTime call from Mary Lynn's iPhone. The face on the other end was not Mary Lynn, but a grizzled-looking man in his 50s, later determined to have been Eustachio Galesi. There was no sound, and the call only lasted a few seconds before it disconnected. The friend immediately contacted Gabriel, who in turn began texting Mary Lynn, never receiving a response. Knowing he'd made this mistake may have been what led Galesi to walk into the police department and admit to killing Mary Lynn. He probably knew he was busted anyway. Another friend of Mary Lynn's, Stephanie LaCure, wrote, quote, The first time I met you, I immediately knew that you were an extraordinary person. I met a unique person who wanted everyone's happiness. I love you. End quote. After Mary Lynn's murder and Galesi's arrest, Marie-Pierre Deschamps, Chantal's daughter, spoke to Journal de Québec, denouncing the decision to release Galesi. She and her relatives knew that Galesi was out of prison and were appalled by the latest series of events. Quote, He had already murdered my mother in cold blood. I might have even bumped into him outside. We don't want him to come out again in 15 years. He's a lost cause. There's nothing to do. Now he has broken up two families. This has to change, she added. Chantel's daughter also shared her thoughts about Marilyn Levesque, whom she did not know. 
Quote, it makes us relive the past. I am inundated with messages. Many people remember the crime in 2004. It's quite heavy. Today, the victim is my age. She is a very beautiful girl. It's horrible. It hurts. End quote. From CBC News, quote, Sandra Wesley, the director of Stella, a Montreal-based sex workers organization, said the case is very concerning because the parole board appears to have given Galesi tacit permission to hire prostitutes, knowingly putting them at risk. Quote, they identified that this man was a potential danger to women and wasn't ready to have proper relationships with women, but figured that he could then go see sex workers, end quote. It really tells us what they think about us, Wesley said. 100% agree with Sandra yeah. Wesley. Yeah, absolutely disgusting. Carrie Porth of Pivot Legal Society, a Vancouver-based organization, weighed in too. According to their website, Pivot partners with communities affected by poverty and social exclusion to identify priorities and develop solutions to complex human rights issues. Their work is focused on four policy areas, police accountability, drug policy, homelessness, and sex workers' rights. Despite the parole board's knowledge of Galesi's potential danger to women, they allowed him to seek services from sex workers to, quote, satisfy his sexual needs. This decision effectively endorsed his participation in criminalized behavior, purchasing sexual services, that would typically result in parole violation. Galesi was considered a threat to women, but the board somehow thought this didn't extend to sex workers. This raises questions about the treatment of other potentially dangerous parolees and the impact of legislation like Bill C-36, which criminalizes aspects of sex work, potentially jeopardizing their safety. It reflects the stigmatization of sex work, implying that the safety of sex workers is not prioritized. To expand on Bill C-36, mentioned by Pivot, it is also known as the Protection of Communities and Exploited Persons Act, enacted by the Canadian government in 2014 to reform the country's approach to prostitution. The law was introduced in response to the Supreme Court of Canada's decision in the case of Bedford v. Canada, where several key provisions of Canada's previous prostitution laws were declared unconstitutional. Bill C-36 represents Bill C-36 represents a shift Bill C-36 represents a shift in policy toward a model that criminalizes the purchase of sexual services rather than their sale. This model is often called the Nordic model or the end-demand approach. The bill also targets third parties who profit from prostitution, making it a crime to receive financial or material benefits from the prostitution of others, including those who run businesses like brothels or escort agencies. Additionally, advertising the sale of sexual service is deemed illegal under this law. On a positive note, the bill provides funding for programs aimed at assisting individuals who wish to exit prostitution, offering support for their transition out of the industry. Critics of Bill C-36 argue that while it is intended to protect vulnerable individuals involved in sex work, it may, it may endanger them by pushing the industry further underground, making it harder for sex workers to protect themselves. The law has been particularly controversial in relation to its impact on the safety of sex workers. Galesi had frequented the massage parlor where Levesque worked, but was banned due to violent behavior. The parlor couldn't report the violence due to the risk of closure and legal repercussions under current sex work laws. Consequently, his parole officer and the police remained oblivious to his escalating risk level. Human Rights Watch HRW.org, advocates for the full decriminalization of sex work as opposed to the Nordic model as in place here in Canada. Human Rights Watch cites research that suggests it is a more effective way of protecting the rights of sex workers by decriminalizing. HRW's position aligns with the preference of most sex workers themselves. So even sex workers feel that their clientele should not be criminalized. We aren't in the 1950s. No. Right? The one thing that drives me mad is when governments try to create morality laws 
Even Daddy Trudeau said that thing of we're not interested in yeah. what goes on in your bedroom. Yeah, because morality, because, you know, I am a gay man, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And I was considered immoral, so there were laws against me, right? So I feel this deeply. Well, that's happening too, again, in Twitbird places, but anyway. But hey, and the, the morality law bullshit has to go. It does. Yeah. Let people be people, for God's sake. While the Nordic model appears to be a compromise that allows politicians to criticize buyers of sex but not the sellers, HRW argues that it has harmful implications for sex workers. It aims to eradicate sex work, making it difficult for sex workers to find safe working conditions, unionize, advocate for their rights, or even open business bank accounts. The model further stigmatizes and marginalizes sex workers, leaving them susceptible to violence and abuse as their work and their clients are still criminalized. Criminalizing customers of sex workers is mm -hmm. as ridiculous. And it's so bleedingly clear yeah. that it would be much safer, much smarter just to let all this crap go. Human Rights Watch continues to opine that sex work is not inherently a form of sexual violence. When an adult willingly exchanges sex for money, this does not constitute sexual violence. However, when a sex worker becomes a victim of a crime, including sexual violence, it is crucial that law enforcement promptly investigate the situation and pursue legal proceedings against the perpetrator. The same applies when a person is forced into sex work due to coercion, such as by a pimp, or if they are victims of trafficking or violence from a client or pimp. These are serious crimes that require urgent attention from law enforcement. Although sex workers often face high levels of violence and abuse, this is usually due to the criminalized nature of their work. Research from organizations like Human Rights Watch suggests that decriminalizing sex work can reduce crime, including sexual violence against sex workers. A vigil to remember Mary Lynn Levesque and against femicide was organized on January 30, 2020 at 6 p.m. in front of the Quebec National Assembly. The date marked a week after her murder. On February 6, 2020, Gillespie requested a meeting with Quebec City Police Service during which he made a self-incriminating confession to Mary Lynn Levesque's murder. Through several media outlets, two former Parole Board of Canada members, Dave Blackburn and Jean-Claude Boyer, suggested that changes to the board's nomination procedures in 2017 may have contributed to the murder of 22-year-old Mary Lynn Levesque. These changes resulted in the replacement of the majority of the experienced board members with newcomers. According to Blackburn and Boyer, the lack of experienced board members could have led to errors in judgment such as this. Boyer argued that an experienced board member would have revoked Gillespie's parole upon learning of his interactions with sex workers. Despite expressing concerns about the risk management strategy, the parole board took no action other than requiring Gillespie to disclose relationships with women. Blackburn and Boyer criticized the nomination process changes which resulted in 14 of 16 Quebec board members being new to their roles. They explained that traditionally an experienced member would mentor a new one, but this was no longer feasible due to the changes. Despite raising their concerns to Prime Minister Justin Trudeau in 2017, they claimed to receive no response. Soon afterward, as requested by Quebec Justice Minister Sonia Lebel, Federal Public Safety Minister Bill Blair announced in the House of Commons that the Commissioner of Correction Services and the Parole Board of Canada Chair would thoroughly investigate the circumstances of Eustachio Gillespie's release. The investigation aimed to understand the events surrounding the release and ensure that any lessons from the situation are learned and applied in the future. Doing damage control, Blair also added, quote, Acts of violence by people on conditional parole are extremely rare, end quote. Conservative members of Parliament jumped on these concerns. They believed more needed to be done. On Valentine's Day, February 14, 2020, Member of Parliament... Pierre-Paul Hughes stood in the House of Commons. He moved, quote, that the House 
a condemn the decision of the parole board of canada that led to a young woman's death by an inmate during day parole in january of this year and b instruct the Standing Committee on Public Safety and National Security to conduct hearings into this matter, including a review of the changes made by the government in 2017 to the board's nomination process, with a view to recommend measures to be taken to ensure another tragedy such as this never happens again. Paul Hughes expressed his disgust and that of his constituents. He continued by criticizing the transformation of the Parole Board of Canada after the government change in 2015. He attributed the alterations to political appointments replacing experienced board members, causing concerns about public safety and effective knowledge transfer. He also mentioned an Auditor General's report from 2018 that highlighted problems with parolee supervision and accommodation. He argued that these issues and controversial parole decisions led to tragic outcomes like the death of Marilyn Levesque. His commentary also brought up the case of Terry Lynn McClintock, the convicted murderer of Victoria Tory Stafford, who was a child at the time. McClintock was transferred from a maximum security prison to a minimum security facility, causing public uproar and resulting in her return to the maximum security prison after the pressure. He also called for a review of the parole board's operations and decision-making process. He quoted Quebec's Justice Minister Sonia LaBelle, underscoring that public safety should be the foremost consideration of the parole process. Lastly, he pointed out a 2017 letter from eight former parole board members expressing concern about the transparency of the appointment process and potential jeopardy to public safety. He concluded by emphasizing the need for protection for everyone in the community regardless of their chosen lifestyle. The Joint National Board of Investigation into the events surrounding the murder of Mary Len Levesque by offender Eustachio Galesi was convened on February 3, 2020. They had already conducted preparation, review work, and some interviews. On February 20th, Galesi pleaded guilty to first degree murder and received a life sentence with no possibility of parole for 25 years. Based on public health guidance, the COVID-19 situation forced travel interviews and meetings related to the work of the Board of Investigation to be suspended on March 20, 2020. The Board of Investigation reconvened in September of 2020 to complete their interviews. The interviews were essential to gather comprehensive and critical information ensuring the investigation's outcomes and recommendations, impartiality, integrity, and transparency. On January 21, 2021, the board's heavily redacted report was released. In summary, it reads, The Correctional Service of Canada and the Parole Board of Canada have responded to the findings and recommendations of a National Joint Board of Investigation report regarding the murder of Mary Lynn Levesque in 2020 by an offender on day parole. The CSC accepted all recommendations from the report to prevent a similar event from occurring in the future. Firstly, CSE has revised its supervision model in Quebec, assuming responsibility for community supervision aspects from Galesi's transitional housing facility, and is evaluating all other Quebec contracts to regain all direct supervision responsibilities for federal offenders. Secondly, CSC has bolstered its community supervision policies and procedures. The updated policy necessitates regular discussion on subjects like the offender's collateral contacts during case conferences to constantly reassess the offender's risk. Thirdly, a mandatory intimate partner violence training program for all parole officers and their supervisors was introduced to enhance their capacity to evaluate and manage reoffense risk. Disciplinary investigations have also been initiated to ascertain additional accountability measures and involved employees have been reassigned and no longer oversee offenders. Even though the Board of Investigation has made no recommendations to the Parole Board of Canada, it had undertaken its own corrective measures. The Parole Board of Canada has provided refresher training to board members on decision writing emphasizing the consistency between verbal instructions given at a hearing and written rulings. Further training has been scheduled and was completed in May of 2021.
Quebec implemented a $41 million program to require certain domestic violence offenders to wear electronic tracking bracelets. The program, which was launched in the spring of 2022, aimed to enhance victim safety and ensure offenders complied with release conditions. The tracking system involved an ankle bracelet for the offender and a corresponding device for the victim, with authorities notified if the two devices got too close. The decision to use the devices was dependent on the victim's consent. The move came after a series of femicides in Quebec in 2021 and, of course, the death of Marilyn Levesque in 2020. This prompted a coroner's report recommending electronic monitors for people convicted of murdering their partners. Had Eustachio Galesi been wearing an ankle bracelet, the report surmised, Mary Lynn's murder may not have happened. His crisis management team would have known where he was and could have taken action. Neither Chantal nor Mary Lynn in any way deserved their fates. More could have been done. We very much doubt that Eustachio Galesi will ever see the outside of a correctional facility, but stranger things have happened. As we've mentioned endlessly, the most notorious long-time Canadian prisoner, Paul Bernardo, has recently moved from maximum to medium security. More on that in a future episode. Who knows what the future holds for Eustachio Galesi. I mean, he only killed two people. Only. Only. If somebody was in control of a, a train or a ferry mm -hmm. and was really bad at their jobs, did something wrong, they can get charged. If somebody dies, they might get charged with a crime, negligent homicide, for example. But, yeah. But when you start talking about the system mm -hmm. in Canada, right? It's always this nameless, faceless system. Parole boards, right? Case management team. Redacted files. Redacted files, right? Yeah. I think potentially mm -hmm. the people on that case management team you should have been charged with manslaughter. Or just just let me provoke that sure, for a second. Okay. Why not? Okay. Why not? They did not put the knife into Galassi's hand. Figuratively, maybe they did. Right. Figuratively. But they did not physically do that. They do not have control over another's Correct. free will. So right. It's easy to say Galesi is the one to blame at this point. I am agreeing with you. The way the system works today, it is Galesi's fault, 100% his fault. Right. Sure, people will probably get a slap on the wrist. Some people may not have continued mm -hmm. in those positions. But what's interesting about that highly redacted report that I read? We, we're, not, we, we're not allowed to hear the truth. Is that what it is, Mike? That is correct. And especially when the truth involves what could be really incendiary against those people that you're talking about, because it talks about knowledge, as I'm aware of part of what was in those redacted reports, it dives into Galesi's background and what caused his domestic violence and the first murder. So, but why does government get away with that when, if they're investigating private citizens or corporation, every text message ever is al already always splashed on the news? Well, it's because it's government, Matthew, and yeah, they, but, they but have to be protected because... They work for us. Well, we don't understand the workings. <sighs> I'm being shitty, but <laughs> we don't understand how things work, Matthew. We need to be protected from ourselves. Horrible. Yeah. Anyway... That's it for Dark Poutine episode I 279. I feel so bad for the women. Yeah. I'm going to be not angry, but sad now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's right. It's time for voicemails. You can leave us a message at 1-877-327-5786 or 1-877-DARK-PTN. We'd love to hear from you. Let's see who called us this week. All righty, let's move on to voicemails. We have one this week, which is great. So uh, let's have a listen. It's a 506 number, so I believe that is New Brunswick again. Hi, everyone. It's Kale calling again. My pronouns are Dan. I'm currently driving back from 
Nova Scotia, Halifax. Um, I just got done writing my NCLEX, my nursing exam, to become a registered, a registered nurse. And I'm finally catching up on episodes. I'm listening to episode 269. And as soon as you mentioned Oromocto, I screamed a little bit because that's where I'm living right now with my military partner. Um, a little a little not so well known outside the military fact about Gage Town is that it's the place where folks <laughs> get voluntold to go when they don't perform well at their military job. So if you are volunteering to go, you're basically guaranteed a spot at Gage Town in Oromocto. But if you're voluntold it's not it doesn't look pretty it doesn't look good. You're probably not going to get it in there. But, yeah, um, I just thought I'd mention that. Um, talk to you later. Bye. So uh, Gagetown is where uh, all my cadet friends used to go in the summer to for training, cadet training as well. But it's interesting that uh, nobody wants to go there. So if you if you volunteer to go to, to Gagetown, yay. If you're voluntold, it's because you suck. Oh, interesting. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't know. Or Mokto is not a bad place. I mean, it's not a terrible place to live. I don't get it. But anyway, maybe it's because it's not near the big city. Maybe that's why it's kind of not the most favored. Let's go destination. I'm I'm all for going to more uh, East Coast I places. So. It, I want to check out the military men. <laughs> you do. Yeah, I do. Well, let's go. Okay. Well, we we know that she's a registered nurse. Right. She's also an Acadian sea shanty composer. Well, there you go. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, apparently one of my grandmother's cousins was a fiddle player. Okay. Playing sea shanties. Like a, a well, world if, known If they had player. lived in the same time, they would have been uh, playing her songs. There you go. Well, thank you so much for your call. Thank you. That's it for this week's voicemails. Again, you can leave us one at one 327 5786 or one 827 We'd love to hear from you, even if it is just to say hi and to tell us to go shit in our hats. If you're stumped for what to chat with us about, a quick story is welcome. All right, it's time for Patreon and Donut Money Donors, and we have a Patreon and we have a Donut Money Donor this week. Nice. So first up is Paulette White, and Paulette is our patron for this week. She is from Hondo, Alberta. Hondo, Alberta. What does Paulette do there in Hondo, Matthew? Hondo was one of my grandfather's favorite Louis L'Amour books. Really? Yeah. Is it about Hondo, Alberta? Uh, no. No, okay. And um, so I think she actually writes uh, Western novels. So <laughs> I'm looking at the Wikipedia en entrance or right. the Wikipedia page for right. Hondo. It's two lines. Hondo is an unincorporated community in northern Alberta with the, within the municipality municipal district of Lesser Slave River number 124, located two kilometers east of Highway 2, 173 kilometers northwest of Edmonton. And that's it. Okay. That's the entire Wikipedia entry. Does it say anything about Hondo by Louis Lamar? No, oh. it does not. I think it was Hondo. So, okay. So... I used to read a magazine called Honcho when I was younger. Uh, yes, that's a different kind of magazine, Matthew. <laughs> Honcho? So... Paulette, what does pa Paulette do? Pa Paulette in writes Western novels. Well, there you go. Yeah. Yeah. Hondo. Well, it, it sounds like a fun thing to do. I sometimes like a Western. I, I don't like the attitude sometimes in Westerns. They're a little antiquated and. She and, does contemporary Westerns. Ah, so, so like no bigots in hers. Yeah. She does cool Westerns. Oh. Like what was that movie with the black sheriff? The movie with the black sheriff. The comedy. I don't remember. And it's a Western. Oh. Blazing Saddles. Yeah, she uh, does like Blazing Saddles sort of stories. Oh dear. Yeah. Well, that's a that's a very irreverent Mel Brooks movie. So, if you haven't seen it and you are sensitive to a certain word, 
Don't. Don't. But know that they're they're doing it to push a point. They, oh, it's definitely it, made. It's to definitely push a, point. a point. Yeah. So Hondo by Louis Lemur is the narrative follows loner Western icon Hondo Lane in his dealings with General Crook's command. Oh, cool. Yeah. That sounds like fun. Well, thank you so much. Thank uh, you. Paulette. Much appreciated. And uh, as far as PayPal goes, we have a little cashola from our friend Jenna Elliott. I don't know where Jenna's from, Matthew, but she says, thank you for the awesome show. It's my favorite thing to listen to at work, I guess, other than her boss. (laughs) Nice. (laughs) Yeah, well. (laughs) She's from Elliott Lake. Elliot, Jenna Elliott is from Elliott Lake. Where is Elliott Lake? You don't know where Elliott Lake is? No. Really? It depends on, like, there's many Elliott Lakes. Where is this Elliott Lake that you're ter- you're talking about, Matthew? It's it's in Ontario. Oh, okay, yeah. There's probably a reason I don't know where Elliott Lake is. Yeah, I, sorry, I didn't, when you said where is it, I just drew a blank for a second because I'm like, what, what, you don't know Elliott, <laughs> Elliott Lake? I don't. Yeah, anyway. Named after, uh, she's yeah, named that, after Elliot Lee. Yeah. Well, that was her family. Oh, well, there yeah, you yeah. go. So what does Jenna do for a job then? She's a lake namer. <laughs> <laughs> no, she's not. Yeah. She's not at all. Okay. Spit it out. I don't want to say. Oh, it's a secret. She's a fog whisperer. She whispers to frogs? Fog. Oh, fog. Yeah. Oh, I thought you said frog. When it's foggy on mm-hmm. the 401. Oh. That, that's also in Ontario. Yes, I know where the 401 is. I've driven on the that. The government, the system, gets her to whisper to the fog so there's no crashes and keep it off the highways. Yeah, don't, yeah. The the fog really, when it comes in on the 401, it's like, holy crap, I can't see a thing. That's why I'm whispering because you, you ever notice when the fog's around, everything seems quieter as well? Yes. Like, even though it's not. (laughs) Even though it's not. Anyway, thank you, Jenna. Much appreciated. Thank you for fog whispering. (laughs) Yes. Thanks to all our patrons and Donut Money donors, past and present, for your generosity. It helps to keep the show going. You can become a patron of Dark Poutine at patreon.com slash darkpoutine. For a one-time donation, you can send us donut money via PayPal using our email address, darkpoutinepodcast at gmail.com. If you don't already subscribe to the show, it would mean a lot if you did. You can easily find Dark Poutine on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. If you haven't gotten yours yet, my book, Murder, Madness, and Mayhem, is available to order via a link on the Dark Poutine website. And speaking of darkpoutine.com, please check it out for show notes and other cool stuff. We'd appreciate it if you took the time to give Dark Poutine a like or a follow on Facebook and Instagram. Most importantly, thank you for listening, and tell your friends about us. Word of mouth is a powerful thing. And that's it for this episode, so until next week, don't forget to be a good egg and not a bad apple. Thanks, y'all. Okay, bye.